left or went against democracy. And, uh, and because of that, uh, the price has uh, skyrocketed in Europe. And here in the United States, 10 years ago, we would have been insulated from that price increase because we weren't part, really, of the global market. But in the last decade, we've started shipping a lot of gas uh, overseas. And so now our gas, uh, as soon as it comes out of the ground, is priced or is at least influenced by the price on the global market. So uh, you may have seen these pictures of, of pipeline in the Baltic Sea that was sabotaged or blown up, presumably by the Russians in order to cut off gas to Europe. This is the uh, price of natural gas in the United States over the last three years. And uh, this, I made this graph yesterday, so this is fairly current. And what you can see is uh, when the Ukraine invasion took place, suddenly there was this enormous uh, spike here in the United States, and it was something like five or ten times this uh, in Europe. So uh, from here on forward, uh, we're part of that global market, and uh, whether it comes from a war or from uh, the uh, machinations of Arab oligarchs or Texas typhoons or whatever it might be, we're kind of uh, in a position, as long as we're dependent on fossil fuels, we're in a position of being blackmailed by anyone that has uh, the means and the mind. Uh, nuclear is another option that a lot of people look at. In the United States, there's only one project that we can currently look at to get an idea of what pricing might be. That is the Volvo unit in Georgia. You can see the comparison here that the Georgia Public Service Commission has made between uh, the price of those units when they come online, hopefully this year, uh, versus uh, gas and versus solar, even solar this solar uh, is going to be uh, way, way cheaper. In fact, because that nuclear plant has had uh, uh, huge uh, cost overruns and long, long delays, it's been 17 or 18 years uh, in the making up to this point, and uh, the $34 billion project. And um, so uh, it is, as it is, just in so far as the capital cost, it is something like 15 times uh, greater than the cost of just putting up solar panels. And this is um, Bill Gates. Bill Gates comes into this because he is a uh, a uh, big proponent of uh, what he calls small modular nuclear reactors, which is supposed to be the next generation that we will see. They are not yet available. Uh, nothing has been actually built yet, but they are in the process. This is him talking about it in 2016. Uh, by 2022, if everything goes perfectly, our demo reactor will be in place. <laughs> and by 2028, again, assuming everything continues to go perfectly, it will be a design that could be replicated and built in many, many, many uh, places. You okay, so he was hoping to have a prototype like last year. Uh, then that slipped to 2028. And then uh, most recently, uh, it slipped again into the 2030s. And uh, that's because there are, I don't know, a dozen or so of these small modular designs uh, they all rely on a certain type of uh, specialized uranium fuel that is uh, entirely pr produced, 100% of the global supply is produced in Russia. And following the Ukraine invasion, uh, people realized that maybe that was not a great idea. So uh, there's a scramble going on now with uh, most of a billion dollars that's been appropriated as uh, part of the recent infrastructure uh, bills to try to uh, jumpstart uh, uh, a fuel program here in the United States that can supply those reactors. So the point I'm making here is that uh, right now, the, the cheapest, most available sources for new electric power are solar and wind. Uh, that, is, that is what is available to us to replace a generation of coal plants that are rapidly aging and uh, starting to get shut down. So as far as what uh, a solar uh, farm looks like, I have some footage from the University of Illinois. This is an installation in uh, Champaign, I believe. And uh, it's sort of, uh, 
to take the camera and keep moving it closer and closer and closer so you can kind of get a, a feel of what this looks like. Stop it right there. Obviously, you can kind of get a feel for the, the There's no sound. Uh, there's uh, these are fairly generic solar panels. I, I presume that these are uh, silicon panels. There's a couple different flavors of these, but basically they're they're passive. They just sit there in the sun. They're not mirrors or anything. They're just panels that, when sunlight hits them, it causes uh, an electric current to flow. And that gets drawn off, off, off into the grid. So uh, they are solid state, more or less like your flat screen TV. They're manufactured in, in big batches. And, uh, and because of that, their price uh, has continued to drop. So that is the look and feel that actually you experience if you're around operating solar panels. But there's a whole lot of misinformation out there, especially on social media. And uh, I want to give you an example of the kind of just brave misinformation that people are being uh, uh, exposed to. And this is a video of uh, a meeting in southeast Michigan where a, an opponent of clean energy is playing for a, a board what he purports to be the actual sound of uh, a solar energy uh, installation. I have an example of the murder noise here if you want to hear it. There's a little flame here. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's no longer the conversation. That's the same noise level of noise in two years. So misinformation is uh, rampant on social media. I you know that's probably a shock to many of you, but uh, this is something uh, we have to uh, look out for. And that's that's the hopefully the meaning of this presentation is to try to get as authoritative answers to questions that people have. And one of the most legit questions is, uh, do farms affect property values? And so, uh, to get an answer to that question, I went to Patricia McGar. Patricia McGar is a real estate, real estate specialist uh, who works with one of the top kind of county firms based out of Chicago. Uh, I interviewed her about a year ago, and I will play this for you. Uh, I'll let her kind of uh, go through what her qualifications are. And uh, she has, uh, over the last five or six years, worked with a team of eight across uh, 15 Midwestern states and evaluating 26 different solar energy installations and she'll tell you what her results have been. I'm Patricia McGar. I'm a real estate appraiser. I am the National Director of Valuation for Cohen Resnick, one of the top 10 accounting firms in the United States. I am an MAI, which is a member of the Appraisal Institute. I'm a CRE, which is a counselor of real estate. I am also a FREC, which is a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, which allows me to appraise real estate anywhere in the world. Um, I have been appointed to the board, uh, the Real Estate Appraisal Board by the Governor of the State of Illinois, and I am currently the chairman of that board. I think back in 2017 was the first time I was approached by uh, a developer doing a presentation to a county board and asked me um, to study existing solar facilities to determine if I had, uh, if it had been determined if, in fact, solar um, installations were detrimental impact on adjacent property value. Uh, we did that first study down in, back in 2017, 
testing and since that time, we have done 26 studies in 15 different states. And in addition to that, we, um, we have looked at published articles and academic studies that have been performed on the same type of issue with regards to if there is any detrimental influence on property values associated with solar installations, either community size or utility size. Community size being less than five megawatts, five megawatts and more being uh, utility size. And we have studied uh, facilities going up to over 100 megawatts, which is a very, in the Midwest, there's one in Ch Chisago, North Star, it's the largest one in the Midwest. Um, we have studied that facility, we, we updated every few years. Um, the assessor in that county also did his own study. Uh, I think about two, three years after it had been developed, he looked at 15 sales that occurred adjacent to the existing solar farm there. It's on 1,000 acres, and he compared it against 700 sales in the rest of the community, or in the, that county area. His study matched ours, is that there was actually no negative influence. You know, what we do is we look at physically adjacent sales, sales that are butting up against a solar farm, because if there's an issue with proximity, the closer that you would be, the more influence there perhaps can be. <coughs> so we've looked at those um, properties. Um, we look at sales adjacent to those, um, and then we look to see if those sales were arm's length, if they went through a broker. We interview the broker, we um, get transfer documents on those sales, and then when we determine that it's an actual bona fide sale, we look for comparable properties that are comparable to that sale that sold within the same, similar time frame, similar in size, similar in you know design, and then we compare those unit price per square foot to the what we refer to as the, the um, target, which is the target area would be any sales adjacent to the solar farm, and we compare that to a control group of sales that are removed from any influence of the solar farm. And our studies have consistently shown that there is no consistent measurable